Okay, so welcome to today's class. It's a conglomerate of a lot of diseases that we are going to talk about. But mainly, what you are going to talk about uh, is the etiology of certain waterborne diseases, um, certain diseases that cause jaundice, hepatitis, and diarrhea. So, if I talk about them first, I'll, I'll take um, waterborne diseases. I'll talk about it first. See, waterborne diseases, as the name suggests, is basically transmitted via water. So, what happens is the water over here acts as a vehicle of infection. So, if the water is not there, then this kind, this infections cannot be spread. So, what happens is that if I talk about water, it's a basic necessity of human beings. 500 liters of water is being used per year by an average adult. So, I hope you can understand the amount of water that each and every individual needs. So, fecal oral transmission that means from the fecus to your oral part, this transmission happens when food or water are contaminated by human or animal excrements or excreta, let's say which contains this pathological organism. So, the human or the animal excreta will have the pathological organisms which will contaminate either the water or the food. Now, how can the food get contaminated? It is because the water which is contaminated is being used to prepare these foods. So, hence the food is also getting contaminated. And contaminated water can be a source of infection which will lead to the occurrence of waterborne diseases, sporadic cases or epidemic outbreaks. So, this particular statement that uh, water as a vehicle of infection is very important for you for your justify part of the questions that you get in your semester or in your professional exams, even in your viva too. So, you need to know this particular part that why water is acts as a vehicle of infection. Next is what is in waterborne disease? Waterborne diseases are any illness that is caused by drinking water which is contaminated by human or animal feces that contains the pathological organism. Simple statement that by you are drinking the water that is contaminated with feces and this particular feces contaminates, uh, contains micro pathological microorganisms which will cause a disease to you if you engulf it. It will include cholera, typhoid, amoebic disease dysentery or bacillary dysentery and other diarrheal diseases. Now, five most common dangerous waterborne diseases that occurs in India are cholera, hepatitis A and E, typhoid, filariasis and dysentery. You may get an NCQ question that tell me the most common waterborne disease that you find in India after an let's say flooding right you will have a lot of questions you will have a lot of options over there you may think ah this can also happen that can also happen always look if cholera is there or not if cholera is there don't look at other options until unless it is not a multiple answer if it is a single choice answer always look for cholera in the question if cholera is there go for it if cholera is not there, then search for leptospirosis. If it is there, if cholera is not present, leptospirosis is present, go for leptospirosis. But if cholera is present and leptospirosis both are present, then first check whether the question is a multiple answer question or a single answer question. If it is a single answer and both these options are present, go always and always go for cholera. But if it is in multiple answer questions, go for both cholera and leptospirosis. <clears throat> in addition, waterborne diseases can be caused by pollution of water also, chemicals that has an adverse effect on human health. Suppose you must have, you must know that all the rivers gets polluted by 
uh, all the uh, industries that dump their uh, liquid products into the rivers, thus polluting the river. What happens is if the pollution levels are too high, the fish in the river is going to die. The people who are dependent on river water for their daily household coils, be it washing the clothes, be it bathing, be it drinking, they are also getting contaminated with the disease, they are also getting exposed to the harmful chemicals. Imagine you drinking the water from the river and contains those harmful chemicals, it is disastrous for your health. The water is being brought back to the home for cooking purposes and you are actually using that contaminated water for cooking, it is also hazardous for health. So this waterborne diseases cannot also happen either because of the microorganism present or because of the pollutions or because of the harmful chemicals. So let's talk about a few <coughs> waterborne diseases that are caused by the chemicals. First and foremost is arsenic, then you have fluoride, nitrates from fertilizers, DDTs which are pesticides we, we, we use for control of malaria, lead from the pipes, heavy metals, chromium, nickel and cyanide. These are all heavy elements that are being released by the factories in the river or in the water bodies which in turn causes water pollution to the, uh, to the, society, uh, to the environment and may cause diseases to humans too when they take that contaminated water. So this is just a diagram from how a human can get infected from waterborne diseases. So I'll just be very brief about it. This picture itself is self-explanatory. I don't need to tell much but I'll still speak a few words. See, human excreta excreted with pathogens. What happens is that either I'll, it will go to the sewage or it will go to your hands or may go to waterborne sewages or may go to latrine or the flies may eat it if it is in the open. If it is from the flies, the fly will again go, go and dump it into the food in general which will be contaminated by the humans. If it is from the hands, uh, let's uh, waterborne, uh, <coughs> non-waterborne sewage, what will happen is that from there it will go to the human hands and from the human hands it will straight away go to the human because the human will use their hands to eat or it may go to the food in general and again from there it will go to the humans. If I look over here, the water bottle, if I talk about the hands, hands will either again <coughs> lead to food or will lead to the humans directly. So this waterborne sewage, what happens is that it goes to the groundwater. From there either it will go as a drink, as a source in drinking water and from there again it will infect the humans. Latrines will also go to the groundwater and again from there it will work, <laughs> use, be used as a drinking water for humans and thus again infecting the humans. Again you have fly, soil, surface and groundwater as a mediator and this again if you can see it's, it's all in arrows that from again it can get infected to uh, the fish or shellfish, uh, food, drinking water, fruits and vegetable and everything everything will come back to the humans. So this is just a pictorial depiction of how a waterborne disease actually gets transmitted to the humans. It's a very, it's not a very vicious one, it's a very simple one, it's just that you know the <coughs> water can get contaminated in n number of ways and in n number of ways that contaminated water can come and reach you. There is also a term called water washed diseases. This disease is caused by poor personal hygiene and skin and eye contact with contaminated water. It includes scabies, tachoma, typhus and other flea, lies and tick borne diseases. I will not speak much on it. Then there are certain water based diseases which are parasites found in intermediate organisms living in contaminated water like cystosomiasis. <coughs> and dracunculiasis. This is a pictorial depiction, or not pictorial, it's a, a table of examples and the route of infection of various diseases. I am not going into much of the details of it, I am just pausing the slide over here for a few minutes. You can ha give it a good read.
I'd suggest that you pause this slide for certain minutes. You read it properly, then you again play it and move on to the next slides. So next we'll talk about all the waterborne diseases that we can have. I'll just go by the names. I'll not go into much of the details. A is adenovirus infection caused by adenoviridivirus. You have amoeba is caused by Entamoeba histolica. Campylobacteriosis is there, which is called by caused by Campylobacter jejuni. Cyclosporidiosis is there, which is caused by Cryptosporidium parasite. Cholera is there, caused by Vibrio cholerae. E. coli is there, which is caused by again E. coli. Giardiasis is there, which is caused by caused by Giardia lambia. You have hepatitis A caused by hepatitis A, legionellosis uh, uh, caused by legionella pneumo, uh, pneumophilia bacteria. You have salmonellosis caused by salmonella bacteria. You have vibrio infections caused by vibrio parahemolyticus or vibrio vulnificus. You have viral gastroenteritis called, caused by calci, uh, calici virus. So these were certain examples of waterborne diseases and the etiology like etiology basically means the causative agents. So I am not going to much of the details of it because you will be taught much more details later on in your life in subsequent years I am not going to. So I will talk about jaundice a bit. What do you mean by jaundice? Jaundice basically means yellowish discoloration of the skin that we normally find. And is jaundice just yellowish discoloration of skin? No. It's a huge entity, jaundice itself. However, one jaundice is very bad for the body, except in one condition. A newborn baby needs to have jaundice, which we call as neonatal jaundice. I am sure you must have read it in physiology, but neonatal jaundice is a totally normal phenomenon. You don't have to do anything about it. The body itself will take care of it. But it's a very important phenomenon for the baby in otherwise in an adult or in a young child it is a bad thing so jaundice is basically yellow discoloration of the skin sclera mucous membranes due to hyperbilirubinemia and deposition of the bile pigments it is usually detectable clinically when the plasma bilirubin level exceeds 50 micromole per liter or 3 mg per deciliter Jaundice is not a disease, but rather a sign that can occur with many diseases. This important is very. This statement is very important. If someone asks you for DD of certain disease, don't say jaundice because jaundice is not a disease. It's just a sign. Jaundice is a sign. It jaundice itself is not a disease, but it says there is something. Uh, some problem is there with your liver. Now you have to find out what. The problem is there, but it is your responsibility as a doctor to find out that what the disease is. So, jaundice, remember, is always a sign. Now, what are the types of jaundice that we, you may have? You have the prehepatic, you have the intrahepatic, and you have the posthepatic. When you will call it a prehepatic jaundice, if the jaundice arises from the blood before it enters the liver, it is called prehepatic jaundice. If Jaundice occurs due to disease in the liver parenchyma, it will be called intrahepatic. If, the if it is a result of the obstruction of biliary tree outside the liver, it is called a posthepatic jaundice. Um, the figures are there in the bottom, I am not going into details of it, but this is just mota mota what are the types of jaundice. Now, over here, if I see what is a prehepatic jaundice, let us say. It's basically increase of the heme liberation. What is the cause, it, cause, uh, cause of this heme liberation? Hemolytic anemia, malaria, and reduced uh, red cell uh, uh, red cell lifespan. If it is intrahepatic, it might be because of defective liver metabolism or obstruction of small bile duct, or uh, these two only. So, if it is a defect of liver metabolism, the causes might be congenital enzyme defect, iron storage decrease and reduced hepatic bilirubin uptake. If it is because of obstruction of the small bile ducts, it will be because of either liver cirrhosis, alcohol silic cirrhosis, immune, uh, autoimmune liver disease, drugs and environmental chemicals, hepatic tumor, pregnancy, viral or other infections, gallstones and primary biliary cirrhosis. 
If it is because of the post hepatic causes, it will be because of mainly obstruction of the large bile ducts. What might be the causative agents? Infection or inflammation of the bile tree, gallstones, carcinoma of the pancreas, carcinoma of the gallbladder, carcinoma of the bile ducts. Also, pancreatitis may be a cause or it may be drug induced. So, if I am talking about drug induced jaundice, what are those? Some examples I will just talk about acetaminophen, salicyclic, tetracyclines, or these are the drugs that may cause drug related jaundice. Now, if it is a dose dependent hepatocellular damage, it will be mostly it is caused by acetaminophen and salicyclates. If it is dose independent hepatocellular damage, most commonly seen in disulfuram, isofurane, and sevoflurane, and antidepressants and amino salicyclic acids. If it is, if it causes hemolysis, this is because of methyl dopa. If it causes cholecystitis, it is mainly because of carmamazole or oral contraceptives or chlorpromazine or chloropromide. Chlorpropromide. So this was a bit about the jaundice. I know I have not said much. I am just trying to give you what might be the causes of jaundice because it, this topic or today's class is basically based on etiology. So I am just talking about uh, about etiology. In brief, if I talk about waterborne diseases or diarrheal diseases, let's say, what are the most common ones that I have? Rotavirus, pathogenic, E. coli, Campylobacter jejuni, Entamoeba histolica, Giardia intestinalis, Cryptosporidium parvum, and Norwalk like virus. Now, there is a certain term called epidemio, uh, epidemic diarrheal diseases. Epidemic means it is already present in huge number. The, the, the disease is actually already present in a huge quantity and it is quite normal in that area. Like if you go to Delhi for the first time in life, you always, everyone suffers from a disease called Delhi belly. You must have a movie on that. But what happens is that when a person outside the circle of Delhi, maybe from South India, goes to Delhi, he or she suffers from severe loose motion for the first three days and it's a common phenomenon. We call it Delhi belly. So it is epidemic. Delhi belly is basically epidemic, endemic, uh, so it's endemic, it's endemic in Delhi. Endemic means already present in there in large number. However, if suddenly there is a case of cholera, it is an epidemic because if cholera happens, it is going to happen in huge number. Cholera is not like that, it will happen to one case here or one case there or one case there. When it happens, it involves a large area. So, epidemic basically means a disease which was not there initially or earlier suddenly came out of nowhere and started infecting a huge number of people. So, that is an example of epidemic. So, epidemic diarrheal disease, uh, basically there are two diarrheal pathogens. One is a Shigella dysentery and another is the Vibrio cholerae. They are particularly infectious and can cause severe epidemics. Epidemic diarrhea caused by both shigellosis and cholera can be triggered by natural disasters or political upheavals that disrupt the normal water supply. Now what are the non-diarrheal waterborne diseases? They are the typhoid, hepatitis, polio, legionellosis and leptospirosis. Typhoid fever, I'll just give a, a bit a brief about them. It's caused by ingestion of salmonella typhi in, back, in food or water and affects around 17 million people each year, causing around 6 lakh deaths. So you can see the water is conf uh, infected with salmonella typhi, the person ingests it. Signs will be white coating on the tongue, rashes in the body, enlarged liver and spleen, and in some cases there might be ulcers in the intestine. If I talk about hepatitis, you know there are n uh, five type of hepatitis A, B, C, D, E. However, C, D is not at all common. A, B, C, and E are the most common ones. So, hepatitis A is causes 1.5 million infection per year, which is the most important of all the hepatitis. What happens in hepatitis is that normally there will be enlargement or inflammation of the liver. This is the size of a normal healthy liver. This is the inflamed liver. Causative agent. It's all genome basically of A, B, C, D and E, RNA, DNA, RNA, RNA, RNA. So only hepatitis B is a DNA based one, rest all are RNA based one. 
Transmission, if I talk about transmission, hepatitis A and hepatitis E are only transmitted by fecal root, rest are all blood borne. Incubation period is also there, diagnosis is also there, possible chronic infection is also there, vaccine is also there. This is just a slide, just to help you to understand the basic of it. Now, how can you prevent yourself from HAV? You have got, you have to improve the hygiene and you have got vaccination for it. If the person suffers from HBV, you have to do screening and improve the hygiene and also vaccination is required. Hepatitis C, again, blood screening, sterile needles, all these things are to be used. Hepatitis D, not very common, but sterile injections are required to prevent this disease. And hepatitis E is also because of hygiene and, yes, practice safe sex and food nutrition. Polio, again, polio is a very highly infectious viral disease that mainly affects the children under 5 and primarily transmitted through the fecal oral route. Safe water and sanitation inter uh, interventions can help you to reduce this risk of contracting polio. This is just a photo of baby being given the polio drops. Do boon zindagi ki, I'm sure you must have heard of this slogan. And this is what happens when you don't take your do boon zindagi ki. Now, what happens in polio is that the muscle, if you can see, are actually weakened. Look at the shoulder muscle and they say it. it's all weakened, it's twitched. So, this look at difference between this leg and this leg. Look at the difference. You can easily understand that this body is dysmorphic. It is how a polio patient looks like. What are the causes? Poliomyelitis, we both know that. But symptoms wise, if I talk about headache, fever, vomiting, sore throat and fatigue are the most common symptoms that you find in case of a polio. But what happens in the polio is that the patient might be suffering from meningitis, flaccid paralysis, loss of reflexes, para or tingling sensation in the legs, severe muscle legs and paralysis of the whole body. Next is legionellosis which can grow in water storage tank, boiler or pipes in distribution system and outbreaks of legionnaire disease is fairly rare. It doesn't happen normally but it's present in those pipes and all those storage water areas and might infect the humans in one way or the other. What happens over here is that the patient suffers from headache, confusion, fever, chill, tiredness, muscle ache, cough, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, etc. And symptoms usually begin. 2 to 10 days after being exposed to Legionella. And last other thing today that we are talking about is called Leptospirosis. It is a bacterial disease caused by ingestion or bodily contact with water contaminated with urine of infected animals, especially rats. Rats are the ones that spread this Leptospirosis. And it may be difficult to diagnose and is often overlooked because it actually happens after flooding. So, what happens over here is that the patient might suffer from rashes, headache, vomiting, high fever, abdominal pain, red eyes, muscle pain, jaundice, diarrhea and cold. Same picture. Just a sign of symptoms. But what are the preventions of leptospirosis? You have to wash your hands, personal hygiene is very much important and wear socks when you uh, shoes. When you go outside after flooding, this will help you to get uh, not to contract this leptospirosis disease and always take medication if you are suffering from fever or any of the symptoms of leptospirosis. So with this, I come to the end of today's class. I am not sure how much you have learned, but I sincerely hope you will open the book after looking at this class. At least have some pity and mercy on me. And I am hopeful that I will see you guys very soon in the college. So till then, take care. Bye-bye.